Okay, thank you, Abraham. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants here, all the speakers. We are starting right now this webinar, Water and Spirituality for Climate Adaptation. It's a great pleasure for us to be here with all these uh, known speakers on the theme, leaderships from their traditions, from their religions, to speak a little bit on this theme of water and spirituality for climate adaptation. So my name is Sergio Ribeiro. I'm from the International Center on Water and Transdisciplinarity, CIRACI. And I'm also part of the board of the International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage from ICOMOS. Yeah? ICOMOS is the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the event, the Global Center on Adaptation, uh, CIRAC, ICOMOS, and its ISC on Water and Heritage, and Justice and Peace Europe. My friends, when we are discussing about climate change, we also have lots of numbers, graphics, technical data, information, uh, and this is very important. This is fundamental. Uh, we are going to have in a couple of weeks, the uh, COP26 in Glasgow, where leaders from the world are going to discuss about the, fu the climatic future of the planet, of humanity, and all the things. Uh, and uh, as a preparatory event for this important uh, event, we are going to have this webinar to give another angle of, the, of, this, situ of this theme of climate adaptation. Yeah, uh, an angle that is not based on science or based on thoughts, but much more based on the spiritual tradition, on faith, on values, and, and the wisdom of these uh, lineages that are today represented here. Yeah, So we believe that it's very important to think the future, to think the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, that we have uh, this reference of the values yeah? of the inner world that we all of us have inside of us uh, to think the future and to discuss the ways we need to work to adapt to this new climate scenario. Uh, this event, this webinar is also a precursor of the dialogue amongst spiritual leaders to be held at the UN Water Decade Midterm Review to be held in New York in 2023. So we are starting a a movement né, that is, is going to contribute to Glasgow, as I just said, but also to this important uh, event in New York in 2023. Today we have this, uh, we have an important launching happening here. That is the launch of the community of practice on water and culture. So inside of the platform or, or the website of Global Center on Adaptation, uh, was just launched uh, this community of practice that is a place where uh, participants from all over the world uh, can interact, exchange about events, articles, reflections on the theme of water and culture, heritage, the contribution of spiritual traditions to think climate adaptation. So I'd like to uh, stimulate all the participants to get to the website of Global Center on Adaptation. The link was just uh, inserted in the, in the chat here of the Zoom platform. So you can go to this link and then you're going to uh, be part of this community of practice. Uh, regarding question and answer, uh, we, the particip the participants here can see the, the, the lectures in the, in, the, in the webinar, but the other participants that are not speakers can uh, interact through the chat, inserting their questions, comments, 
and the organizers of the event are going to uh, select and we are going to have in the final part of the webinar a moment uh, to of interaction where I'm going to read some of those questions and the speakers are going to answer or comment the points, okay? So I think uh, we can we can start. Uh, we are going to start with the first lecturer, that is Maria Hammershoy. So Maria works in the overlap between states and the faith communities. She's the vice president of Justice and Peace Euro Europe, a network of 32 nation justice and peace commissions mandated by their bishops' conferences to speak out on the fight against poverty and human rights, peace, reconciliation, development, and the care of creation. She's also the Secretary General of Caritas Denmark. Caritas Denmark with, lo with local churches, primarily in Africa and Asia, in providing humanita humanitarian aid and green development in line with the sustainable development goals. So Maria, welcome, you have the floor and you have 10 minutes for your uh, talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, one second. I'll just share here. Okay. I hope you can see my screen now. I'm just going to... Be ready in one second. Cool. So thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I am speaking to you from the uh, Diocese of Copenhagen, which covers uh, Denmark down here and the North Atlantic here and then all of Greenland, which is in the Arctic. So you see the world here and I'm up here in the far north. Uh, in trying to answer the questions that you that is posed by this conference. I'm going to first give you a quick introduction to how we at Justice and Peace have worked with water as a common heritage to all humankind. Then I'll speak a little bit about Laudato Si and the Catholic resources. And then I'm going to talk about why faith communities are important in all climate discussions, of course, including climate adaptation. Uh, and I'll do that with an example from my world or from uh, my part of the world, the Arctic. So water is, of course, a common heritage of all humankind. Water is what connects us literally by the oceans and the rivers, spiritually by the sacredness of water in all religions, and biologically as a human family. We are water in the sense that the larger part of our bodies is water and we very quickly die if we don't have access to water. So Catholic social teaching based on scripture and tradition are the Catholic guidelines for human life on earth and the care for creation. Through social Catholic through the social teaching, Catholics are encouraged to actively take part in the stewardship of Earth and in the lives of their fellow humans and to consciously monitor the, their own actions. Churches and other religions are drivers and multipliers of the concerns regarding water. And since 2018, Justice and Peace Europe have, has addressed water as a common heritage in two themes. One is water, the source of life, human right and responsibility for Europe. And the other one is the common good of the seas. Issues like water as a human right, sustainable fishing, the working condition of conditions of the seafarers has been addressed, but also the impact of climate change and the pollution from plastics, as well as specific challenges to the Arctic region. We've contributed and raised awareness on local parish levels and on institutional and political level by, for example, contributing to the recent uh, European Union consult consultations on international ocean governance and the EU Arctic policy. 
So our theological base, uh, if if we can call it that, uh, are I'll, I'll bring the three most important sources. Uh, over here, the Bible it needs no further introduction. As a spiritual doc document, it holds great wisdom on water. Water is mentioned approximately 722 times. Seas, rivers, heavy rain, lack of rain, thirst, floods, and the cleansing qualities of water are abundant. None of these issues are new to humankind. And since Noah had to build an ark, faith communities have been creative and resilient to any kind of change. Laudato Si uh, from 2015 is Pope Francis' super popular encyclica, which has had immense impact on the Catholic world. I'm sure uh, some of the other panelists will speak about Laudato Si, so I'll keep it very short. Um, it focuses especially on the interconnectedness of all things and the intergenerational perspectives of climate change. Catholics at all levels, from the Curia in Rome to the ladies in the local parishes across the world, have been engaged in activities to promote care for creation. And of course, water is a very big part of this. The third one is Aqua Fonts Vitae, which was published by the Vatican in 2020. And the document looks at water as it calls attention to several challenges for the human family. This document describes three aspects of the use of water. Water for, hum for human use, water as a resource used in human activities, especially agriculture and industry. Water as a surfa surface, meaning rivers, undergrounds, aquifers, lakes, and above all, seas and oceans. For each aspect, the document presents related challenges and operating proposals for awareness raising and for commitment at a local level. The document recognizes the value of water in different ways, the religious value, the social, cultural and aesthetic value, the institutional value and a value for peace and, of course, the economic value. The final part of the document offers a reflection about education and integrity. So why are faith communities important in all climate discussions? What we see again and again all over the world is that when a crisis hits, when states collapse, when disasters happen and wars break out, faith communities step up. Traditionally, the faith communities, they run schools, they run hospitals, they run orphanages, care facilities, and they have great organizational strength as well as inherent hope and love for humankind. I'm sure my fellow panelists will give you many examples of this, um, and I will now give you one from my part of the world where water at the moment is shifting shape from ice to water, causing rising sea levels. So climate change is happening uh, and it's been going on for many years and the Arctic is, there's no doubt, uh, it is melting. This has and will increasingly have consequences for people's livelihood in many parts of the world. We have technologies available to stop this, but this too will have consequences for lives in many parts of the world. We are therefore in a situation where no matter if we act or we don't act, there will be consequences for people's lives. Thus, the Arctic represents a special challenge for the human family since it requires a global collaboration and it requires going beyond self-interest. The benefit that humanity will be able to draw from technological progress completely depends on the degree to which new possibilities are at our uh, the new, tech, new possibilities at our disposal are being employed in an ethical manner. Faith communities are not exactly known to be first movers, but the major world religions have accumulated thousands of years of reflection on human, humans as caretakers of earth, as well as ethical and moral reflections on new technology and large scale risk. These reflections are actively in use across faith communities. Quickly, before I end, three principles that I think are important. The first principle I want to bring to, uh, 
uh, I want to mention is the universality of the Catholic faith. In discussions at the political level of countries and regions, politicians obviously, and rightly so, represent a co local community or a country. But the discussion on the Arctic must be universal in its approach, considering everybody in all countries affected. And there are countries across the world that are looking at complete extent, extinction in, uh, in about 30 to 40 years because of rising sea levels. Uh, faith communities can be that universal voice in discussions otherwise rooted in local Commun uh, local politics. Second principle I want to mention is the principle of the common good. The guiding star of any reflection must be the value of the common good and the protection of the dignity of the human person. Related to the principle of the common good is the principle of the lesser evil. This means that if you're in a situation where the outcome may not be great or the common good is not attainable, you must decide which option represents the lesser evil. These are extremely difficult discussions to have, but relating to climate issues, this is often the situation we will end up in. Final principle I want to mention is the preferential option of the poor. This principle means in very simple terms, that if one of us is poor or ill or otherwise vulnerable, then that should be our focus and priority. We must leave no one behind and we cannot thrive as a human family if we do not treat our poor brothers and sisters well. By extension, the poor is the one who has no voice or advocacy. Uh, and uh, that also means the unborn or the next generations. Uh, most faith communities can and will focus on the poor and the voiceless and will give them privilege in these discussions. So, to finalize, what is needed to adapt to the climate changes caused by uh, changes in the Arctic is large scale political will and cooperation, but change is impossible without a process of introspection, conversion, motivation, and education. Before I pass the word to the next speaker, I will quote Francis, who recently concluded a conference, conference by affirming that a better world is possible thanks to technological process if this is accompanied by an ethic inspired by a vision of the common good, an ethic of freedom, responsibility, and fraternity capable of fostering the full development of people in relation to others and to the whole of creation. Indeed, a new dialogue on how we're shaping the future of our planet is much needed. The conversation must include everyone and the faith communities have a lot to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Your lecture were very inspiring, give a very nice overview on some important approaches from Catholic Church and Caritas, and also highlighting some so necessary approaches like the common good and highlighting the importance of faith community, communities in crisis moments that we are going to face more and more, and the necessity of going beyond self-interest to think in a collective perspective or in a collective way. So thank you so much for your contribution. Would like to uh, invite the next uh, speaker that is Mona Polaka and Austin Nunes. So Mona Polaka serves as a co-secretariat of the Indigenous World Forum on Water and Peace. She has been an invited speaker to the 2020 Symposium on Water and Culture, International Heritage Water Culture Conference in 2019 and the Great Water and Heritage Forum in 2018, presenting an indigenous worldview on water. Mona is a founding member of the International Council on, of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, which, which is an alliance of indigenous women from around the world who are upholding, preserving, and protecting the earth-based medicine, indigenous practices, and beliefs. Her tribal lineage is of the is of the Hava Supai, Hopi, and Tiwa tribes. Mona currently is serving as a senior fellow of the Center for Earth Ethics based in New York. 
And together with Mona is going to talk Austin Nunes, uh, that is the chairman of the Walk San Javier district of the Tohono O'odham Nation, located in the arid Sonora Desert region of Southwest Arizona, USA. He's the founding member of the Native American Church of Southern uh, Arizona and spiritual leader of his tribal tradition, earth-based medicine practices and ceremonies. So Mona and Austin, you have the floor. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to greet each and every one of you. My name is Mona Palaka, and I'm speaking to you from the uh, land and territory of the Thana Otham Nation, located in, in the Tucson, Arizona, United States. And uh, I'm grateful to be able to speak to you today on behalf of um, my indigenous people. Uh, Havatsupai are the people of the blue-green water. We are people who live at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And just from that heritage that I come from, as a member of the Havasupai people, that establishes for me my sacred relationship with the water, which is what I'm going to speak from, my traditional Native American Havasupai heritage that I have grown up with throughout my lifetime. And when it comes to indigenous wisdom and knowledge, we do not have sacred text. We do not have scholars of our spirituality, our spiritual practices and beliefs. What we base our wisdom and knowledge on is our relationship with the place where we live, the place where we come from, which we consider our life. And with that in mind, we also embrace a concept that we are all related. We are all related through the basic foundations of life, of which water is the first foundation, according to the teachings I follow. We were inside water in our mother's womb. We lived there for three quarters of a year. And when it was time for us to be born, the water, it came out of our mother's womb and we followed it into this world. And because of that, we call the water our sacred mother water. We call it the life-giving element, our first foundation of life. It's good that we could come together as interfaith representatives. It's important for us as the representatives of the spiritual communities globally to have dialogue. This is an opportunity to learn about the growing and important role of faith communities in the global right of this right to water, but beyond human need, we must also consider the plant life, the animal life. All of the beings that we share life with here on Mother Earth. And so it's very important and a timely, a timely moment. It's historical and it's monumental that we come together to share this dialogue. Indigenous people have been reaching out across cultures, across faith, across geography, and recognizing that 
it's important that we consider that life on Mother Earth is dependent upon how we uphold our relationship with Mother Earth. That the long history of our efforts of the indigenous people has been to maintain a sense of balance where we live and especially in relationship with the water. I found in my work as the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers, I found that most world religions or all the world religions that I have come in contact with have a spiritual connection and spiritual teachings about the water. And that the water is a blessing and water is used as a blessing. In my teachings, when I come upon water, it's important for me, for my well-being and spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, to acknowledge the water in a sacred manner, to approach it with respect and humility, to introduce myself to it and acknowledge that it is my life. And so this is a practice and in our ceremonies, we have time where we take a moment to acknowledge the water. We have a time, we take a moment, and we sprinkle the water on Mother Earth as an offering. As an offering to the Mother Earth, as an offering to all of life on Mother Earth. It's not just for me. It's for all of life on Mother Earth. And these are simple, basic practices that Indigenous people have been carrying forward. The Indigenous people have practiced what I, I'm calling water ethics. And in water ethics, we have a practice of honoring and respecting and valuing the water. And it's very important that um, uh, we can join together as a one of our Native American leaders, Chief Sitting Bull of the Lakota Nation said, let us put our minds together and see what life we will make for our children, our grandchildren, our future generations, the ones we will not see. And it's also important for us to consider that we have to be adapt an adaptive civilization and that we have the ability to make change. We have the ability to look at how our waters are actually finite to look at how our waters over time, especially with the climate change, is becoming more and more scarce in some places. And over 80% of the world's biodiversity 
is taken care of by Indigenous people. We as Indigenous people have not left the place where we originated from. We have constantly resided and lived in the places where we say the Creator put us, our home. We have this concept that we must take care of this place, the place where we have our water, the place where we have our land and from which we have our food sources and have relationship with the, the plant medicine, with the animal life, with the water life, that we have this relationship and we say we are all related. And again, that extends beyond our villages, our little communities, our tribal nations. It extends all around the world, all around Mother Earth. So it is very important for us to continue to move forward. Uh, and um, we as Indigenous people are calling for the, um, the acknowledgement and the protection of our water sources as our cultural heritage and our spiritual well-being. And so I just want to share that with you here today. I give thanks for this day to the good creator for all of the waters of the world. And may your water be good today. Blessings. Thanks, Mona. Thank you so much. And now we have Austin Nunes, you have the floor, Austin. Good day to each and every one of you. Greetings, it's uh, good to meet all of you. Um, I come from uh, the Thon Adam Nation, uh, Santa Barbara District, uh, Wak community uh, in the dry uh, Sonoran Desert of Southern Arizona and uh, Northern New Mex Northern Mexico. Uh, our people have lived here in this area for hundreds uh, of years. And uh, we have come to know this area uh, very intimately. And as a desert community, we become reliant on rain, rainfall. And fortunately for us in our community here, there was a uh, small uh, river that flowed here. And that's the reason our forefathers settled here. And so um, through the teachings of our ancestors, we've come to know that all of God's creations have a spirit within them and that spirit needs to be recognized and uh, and uh, treat it uh, with great respect uh, plant life animal life we as humans and so uh, in our uh, existence here uh, we have become dependent on a saguaro the saguaro cactus which we call hashin it's a large tall it's a tall columnar cactus that grows about 30, 40 feet high. And uh, it does have water inside it. But the uh, the important fruit that we use for our rain ceremony, we collect the fruit uh, in late June. And uh, we we call that the beginning of our uh, new new cycle of life because of the, the harvesting of the soar fruit. So we use it to make jams, make syrup, and then we eat the seeds or use it later in the winter time when there's uh, less uh, food to eat. We, we use the, um, the cakes of the swaro uh, seed. And so uh, at the end of the uh, harvest time for collecting the fruit, um, we, uh, we then ferment the syrup into a ceremonial wine, which was the only time that our people drank any alcohol. And we have a four day ceremony calling for the rain uh, we have a sacred fire lit. We have our eagle plumes represented. We have our medicine people using their eagle feathers to call for the rain. And they're inside uh, next to the fire and uh, all the people are dancing around them. And then at the conclusion of the uh, ceremony on the fourth morning of the fourth day, uh, the, uh, the um, 
a ceremonial wine is consumed and um, more songs are sung calling for the rain. And uh, once the, uh, the um, ceremonial wine was uh, consumed, everyone went home and then it would rain four days later. And that was pretty consistent. And uh, the, uh, the, all of the natural environment that we have, we, through our creation stories, we've come to know that uh, the wind and the rain are brothers. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole story to that, which I don't have time to tell, but I just want to say that when the, rain, when the wind comes, um, it brings his brother, the rain, and the rain is uh, blind. So the wind can see where they're going. So when the winds come, and we know that at least in the summertime, that the, the rain is not far behind. And uh, once the, the, the wind comes through with all of the dust, and kind of settles, then the rain comes with all the thunder and the lightning. And this, this is what we call our monsoon season. So once the road, those rains come, then we have uh, the floodwaters to uh, use to divert, to irrigate our crops, especially in the more drier parts of our uh, Thonal Domination Reservation. And in here for, uh, here at Wak community, uh, south of us, it's, it's dry there because the river is further away. So we, we realize that with climate uh, change, the, the cycle of these rains is very inconsistent. And uh, we're fortunate th just this past summer that we had very good uh, rains. Uh, in the last three, four years, we only had one or two occasions for rain to uh, uh, bless, be blessed with rain. And we realized too that here in this region, we are in, in a drought and it's been going on almost maybe 15, 16 years. So um, when we uh, use the water, we always uh, ask for its blessing. We pray for it. We ask for its abundance and we, we use the water as medicine. And we know that we cannot exist without water. And um, we, we know that uh, in, in planting, uh, we've always had ceremony. We, we pray prior to planting. We have planting songs. And then as our, as, as our people uh, uh, plant the seed in the ground, we pray to the seed. We ask the seed for its bounty. And then once harvest time comes, we again have prayer for harvest and we have harvest songs. And then the, the, uh, the, uh, at harvest time, we share the, uh, the crops, the abundance of crops with our relatives who are more in the more drier regions. And so this cycle of life that we had prior to the introduction of all the uh, uh, modern convenience, plumbing, the electricity, uh, we lived in harmony and balance with all of creation. And so we continually uh, in educate our children to uh, look towards that, to uh, really uh, assess, you know, do they really need uh, these conveniences that we have, we realize that the that there are positive things with the uh, these um, new technologies, and we appreciate them being uh, the, uh, with us today. While at the same time, though, as Indigenous people, we still rely on where we came from and who we are, and recognize that we also we have been placed here in this part of the world by our creator to take care of uh, the, the natural resources here, much as other indigenous populations have that same kind of uh, thought and uh, care for their environment. So we continually pray as uh, we go forward to uh, have more rains. And uh, we, we are one of the communities that have become to rely on outside uh, sources of water because of a 23 year legal challenge to reaffirm our water rights and to uh, to uh, um, have the uh, United States government uh, uphold its obligation to us to provide for our health, education and welfare because of uh, their taking the land uh, as they had um, at least uh, two, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago. And uh, so uh, we now rely on Colorado River water, which is 300, a, 300 miles away. And a pipeline system is built to provide us with the water. And so we have uh, 
enough water to uh, sustain our farming. We've always been a farming community. We use some of it for repair and restoration. And through uh, the indirect recharge from those two uh, activities, uh, our river that uh, stopped flowing has now begun to flow again, uh, even though it's just very small. We are very grateful for that. And we continue to pray that uh, the Colorado mountains have more snowpacks so the snow uh, can melt and then feed the Colorado River, which supplies vast amounts of water for large populations uh, in New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Colorado. So we recognize that uh, even though we're only a small part of the world here, we realize that we can have an impact globally through our prayers and the prayers of everyone else on earth that is seeking the same thing. We all want the same thing. We all want to be healthy. We all want to be happy. We all need, want to live in harmony and balance with all of our God's creation. So I appreciate this opportunity to say uh, and share these uh, uh, this information from my uh Kwa community people. And uh, I appreciate all of you that are doing everything to ensure that uh, all of us can continue to live in harmony and balance and with equality and justice as we move forward. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Alcinunias and also Mona Polaka to give us this perspective of the tribes and the traditional people from North America, highlighting this uh, importance né, of integration and oneness. Yeah? because the, uh, the tribes have this uh, traditional way to see things as one. So we are nature uh, and we need to protect nature and protect ourselves. Uh, and also highlight the point of water ethics mentioned by you. Yeah? And the idea that I think is very important to think the tomorrow to think the sustainable development goals and to think the future there is about the sacredness of water now there is a thing that is very important and and the spirit of all creation including water now as uh as also just mentioned so thank you so much for your contribution here to our webinar and i would like to uh give the floor to our uh next Lecturer, that is Hassan Shiko. Uh, that is, uh, he's a tutor in the University of Birmingham. Since 1997, Hassan Shiko has worked on both teacher and teacher trainer at eminent higher education institutions in a number of countries, including Pakistan, Oman, and the UK. His career began as a journalist. As a journalist, he has worked for the Frontier Post as, uh, and as a senior news anchor at Business Plus, a satellite TV channel. He has delivered a lot of lectures and produced a lot of articles and programming on the philosophical underpinnings of Islam and the relationship between religion, culture, and the media. So Hassan, welcome. You have the floor, you have 10 minutes for your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you very much, everyone, as well, for your attendance. I'm going to talk, as I was asked to, uh, talk from the Islamic perspective on this uh, subject of water and spirituality. And so I'm going to focus more on the spiritual. I'm going to try and focus on the spiritual aspect of it as best I can. Uh, the overview of uh, what I hope to talk in the next 10 minutes is as follows. I'm going to briefly touch, in fact, I'm going to be touching briefly on all of these, not in much detail, I don't think. Common ground, water and its spiritual significance, uh, what Allah in the Quran says, what the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, what Imam Ali alayhi salam says, uh, the, the person who was appointed by Allah uh, informed the the Ummah after, uh, to be the one to lead the Ummah after the Prophet. The other significance of the water in Islam, I refer to briefly to the story of Hussein and his infant, 
And I will take you to a very practical scheme or project that's going on. It's called the Early Asphalt Water Appeal. And if I have time, I will make a blunt suggestion to inspire a repeal to at least the Muslim community. Now, uh, before I proceed, there was a, a further, there was a, a question asked somewhere here by, I forget the name now, about whether we do, we, whether how much can the spiritual aspects be used to inspire communities to uh, conserve water? Uh, it's very much so, I think, because uh, individuals uh, operate on a very intrapersonal basis uh, and intrinsically they are thinking and that needs to be triggered uh, so that they can act. Of course, most of the time we end up tending to focus on the communities that may be chucking uh, plastic in water sources, etc. And then, you know, we say we need more education. But um, I think more than that, we need to try and check the big corp that is actually producing all that plastic and the one most responsible for pollution of our uh, environment. Um, so we, we need equal focus, if not more, on the big corp than the small man. Anyway, um, let's go to the common ground. Yes, as you've heard, even among the native uh, North American uh, couple presentations that you've heard, there is a lot common uh, evolution, for example. There are a lot many things we could say, uh, but let's just focus for a second on evolution. It's very much common in Islam, in Christianity, Judaism, Shinto, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. Um, we also know from those of us who are a bit uh, well versant with the scriptures or holy books, uh, we know about the Virgin Mary being asked to go to a place in the east and then she'll find a tree, a date palm, she needs to shake it so that she can get some sustenance in the form of dates and then she's asked to uh, hit a stick or rub her, her feet on the ground and there would be water flowing forth. Uh, likewise, in the case of times of Moses, we know about the 12 tribes uh, water supply that was created when he uh, put his staff and triggered a set of 12 streams. Uh, I went to Japan several years ago and I was quite uh, fascinated to see how common the Islamic style of ablution is, as the Shinto do when you want to, and the Buddhists as well, when you want to enter their shrines. It was so beautiful to see and I actually did that practice. It was, it was a great, great experience to see such a commonality in even uh, beliefs, practices, or religions, if you will, that are apparently disparate. They're not, but that's how we've been made to understand. Uh, in Hinduism, we have the holy uh, bathing that people do. So that we've got a lot of uh, commonality across the world, and that's what we need to exploit. Now, if we take an example here, which is quite fascinating, uh, to me, Prophet Muhammad, uh, I'm paraphrasing, said, do not wipe off the ablution water from your skin with a cloth. Let it dry on its own. And I've always wondered why. And several years ago, uh, there was this report or study by Masaru Imoto, and he talks about the effects of positive words and thoughts on, the, on water. He does this experiment. Probably a lot of you are aware of it. Uh, and he sees how the water molecules change shape when there is a positive uh, environment or there is a negative one. Now, uh, scientists have said this, that is pseudoscience. If it is fine, I think we need to do more research. But if it is true, which uh, probably is because uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't yet know your name. So I'm just going to say the gentleman uh, who was talking about they pray before they plant, but they pray for rain and all of that. So these things do seem to have an effect uh, on, on our, our environment. Um, so it should have or would have an effect in water. And what I would ask is for more, in order to make individuals make a move, uh, like Maria said at the onset, uh, people of faith take their time to become active uh, about sorting things out in their environment, which is very true. So I think uh, if we want to appeal to, the, to, to those kind of people, we 
need to put some scientific research in this aspect, whether water does change its molecule structure, molecular structure, if there is a positive prayer or a prayer being being said. And then that makes me understand why the Prophet of Islam said, let the water absorb into your skin, because while you're performing revolution, you would have been saying nice words, good words, good prayer. So I think that's the kind of thing that would inspire people to be uh, a bit more uh, conscious of water conversation, conservation. All right, I'll proceed to the next slide. Now, while that's the common ground, let's focus on what the Quran says. The Holy Quran says, uh, Allah in the Holy Quran says, have you not seen that Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth? So what basically he's trying to say here is that I created everything by way of justice. And what is being claimed in that is haq, it's the truth. Now, why do I mention this? We'll see in the context of the following verses. You see, I've got this word Allah created written in blue, and then the words we send as well in the next verse from uh, Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse 22. Allah says, and we send the fecundating winds that cause the rain to descend from the sky, therewith providing you with water to drink. And it is not you who hold its reserves. Now, we might see here Allah being like a jealous God, and I don't intend blasphemy, but this is what uh, some critics say. You've got a very jealous God. Now, here, there's what I understand what he's trying to say is, you're not the one who owns these things, the systems of the world. I am the one who gave to you them to you for free. So be generous with them and don't be arrogant on the, when you walk on the back of the earth. So remain humble and share and be conscious that I created things with justice and I gave provisions. I made provisions for your sustenance and your existence. So do not mess it up. You're not the one in control of them. Likewise, if you look at the second uh, line of the second uh, verse, and it is not you who hold its reserves. Now we can see from here that uh, Allah has made or God has made provisions in the, on, at least on the surface of the earth, uh, on planet earth for containing water as a reservoir for us to go to draw water from, etc. Now, if we look at what's happening in India, for example, if we come to, to the practical aspect of it, what's happening with the Adivasi land, Bauxite is being taken out, for example, and other minerals that then make the mountains porous. That means the water doesn't get retained in those reservoirs and effectively they create floods. And then when there is no water in reserve, there is drought and what have you. So I think here we, we see that we are being reminded because you see the Quran doesn't, it calls itself, it's a reminder. So here it's constantly trying to remind us to preserve the earth, be conscious of uh, the fact that we are uh, here on a temporary basis and we don't own these things. So we must be careful so that others can have a right to the same things as well. There are further verses about the water cycle. It's reminding, it's reminding again about how the water cycle actually occurs. And Allah says, we sent rain down from the sky in perfect measure. And in another verse in Surah Zukhruf, it says, it is he who sends the winds, who sends down rain from the sky in perfect measure. So according to scientific facts, uh, let's reconfirm if this is not truth, because there are so many figures that I was getting on the internet, uh, at least 16 million, approximately 16 million tons of water or vapor is exchanged uh, every, every second uh, on planet Earth. So you see, it's talking about a perfect measure and I relate it with the fact of Allah saying here, I created the heavens and the earth in truth with justice. So you can see there is an equal perfect measure there. Proceeding, uh, unfortunately, what we notice across the world, and I, like I said, I'm going to be straightforward and this is uh, for with a positive intention. What I notice around the world is that when, for example, Muslims are performing their uh, wudu, which is ablution in English, they waste a lot of water. Now, the Quran, the reminder is very, very clearly saying, wash your um, faces and your forearms to the elbows, wipe your heads and your feet to the ankles. He intends to purify you so that you can be thankful. 
But what we do is we run the tap at full blast and that's a lot of water resource being wasted. And Allah again reminds people saying, oh, children of Adam, eat and drink, but waste not. And um, I've posterized this so that we don't recognize the person at all. But if you might notice, there is the tap running while the person is performing his ablution. Uh, these basic things on an individual level need to be reminded to the uh, people uh, before we proceed with uh, looking at the greater scheme of things. It's these small acts that are going to make a difference. Uh, one of the most fascinating hadiths or sayings of the Prophet that uh, I know of is this one. And I think this is the tip of the iceberg or it epitomizes the entire concept of water conservation. We don't need to import experts when you've been given such an amazing singular statement that is so meaningful. Do not waste water even when you're performing ablution at a stream. I mean, this just reverberates if you think about it. Imam Ali alayhi salam said the uh, next in line after the Prophet Muhammad, when the good doers will be rewarded on the day of judgment, the beginning will be made with those, i.e. beginning of giving the blessings will be given to those who serve water to a thirsty person. Now this is the importance of uh, conserving water, serving water, sharing water resources with other people that Imam Ali talked about. And even the Prophet said that anybody who serves water to somebody gets uh, the blessings worth uh, 72 uh, ritual prayers that a person might make. Now, it may not necessarily be some exact mathematics of 72, but I think these kind of figures were used to inspire people to do good. Now, that takes me uh, this bit here where uh, the beginning will be made with those who serve water to a thirsty person. It takes me to an event in history, the other significance of water in Islam, where uh, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, uh, Imam Hussein, salam, along with his 72 companions was martyred thirsty in the land of Karbala. And it was not only these uh, men and children that were killed by the enemy who had blocked his access to the river uh, where the battle was taking place in Karbala, but they also murdered his infant with a three-pronged arrow. And what Imam Hussein was trying to do was take the child to the enemy to say, okay, you got a problem with me, fine. But this child who was barely six months or a year old, an infant, at least give him some water. He hasn't had it, let's say, for a day, for three days, whatever the number. But in the thick of a desert, you can well imagine what level of thirst there would be. But they still murdered the, the infant. Now, this happened approximately 1,400 years ago. But this infant, in even his, um, hap in, in his, in his helpless situation, what he's done is that he, along with his father, have, have uh, both inspired what we call the walk of love, where every year about 15 to 20 million people uh, walk from a city in Iraq, Najaf, where Imam Ali al salam is buried, all the way to Karbala, which is about 80, 85 kilometers away from it. And Imam That's Hussain al salam along with his kid, is buried there. Uh, just one slide, and I'm done. Now, uh, this kid has inspired the... Uh, Ali Asghar Water Appeal, Cycling Sportive. It's a 10-year-old project now uh, that uh, the Ali Asghar Water Appeal project has been building, uh, constructing, and supplying water facilities to people in the downtrodden parts of the world. On, 20, on the 12th of September, 2021, 130 cyclists participated in London on a 100-kilometer uh, ride, and they raised 116,429 pounds from around the world, and the money is going to be spent in Pakistan, Kenya, Afghanistan, as well as Gaza. So uh, the spiritual aspect, the historical aspect of water and water-related events uh, can be used to a positive uh, a degree. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you so much, Hassan, for your interesting presentation on the Islam tradition to water, some perspectives, very interesting. First of all, remembering the, the sense of uh, this common uh, practice of abruption in many traditions, but also calling for people of faith to become active, active in environmental issues that is very important.
yeah, or if all the traditions can have this possibility of inviting their uh, participants uh, to cooperate and to help to ab adapt to this new climate scenario would be something really amazing and important and relevant. And just a final remark, uh, you receive water for free and it to, you need to give it for free. That is also an important message that may uh, make us think on the way we are dealing with water uh, and the, the, the market of the water and water as a commodity. So is, is that the way, the right way to go? So many reflections can emerge from this, from this uh, thought. So thank you so much. Okay, and, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And then to advance uh, on our uh, webinar, I would like to invite Valerian Bernard. Valerian Bernard is, uh, is in the NGO representative of the Brahma Kumaris to United Nations in Geneva. She has been actively involved in the ecological movement since Rio 1992, promoting sustainable development, development in raising public awareness about the forces that drive climate change. She creates tools to lift aware, awareness to advance the standing of women, promote fair relationship with our environment, resolve workplace disharmony, and through interface gatherings, broaden cultural understanding. She's the chairing, she's co-chairing the interface li liaison committee to the UNFCC since 2014, and is co-founder of the GME Interfaith Forum on Climate Change, Environment, and Human Rights, an informal group of faith-based NGOs reaffirming the responsibility of each faith to care for the earth and address climate change and its impacts. So, Valerine, welcome. You have 10 minutes. You have the floor. I thank you very much. Um, to Sergio, the organizers, and also all the panelists that have been talking before me, setting up such a, a powerful atmosphere of uh, spiritual vision. And um, it's always an advantage when you talk next because you don't need to repeat what your friends and colleagues have been saying. So in response to the questions that were posed to us, I would like to um, ask all of you a question. Could it be that we have forgotten the sanctity of life, overlooking what's the most important aspect of each human being, that is the inner being, the spiritual being? Within the Brahma Kumaris tradition, we understand that, yes, the vehicle of the body is absolutely vital, important, and sacred, but it's the living being, the soul, the spirit, that's life itself, the life force. In today's world, our highlighted consumerism and materialism has had terrible impacts, and we've moved away from the understanding of the life force completely, and as a result, lost values for even our own inner being, our own spirit. Equally, there is no response for the, no respect for other forms of life and also no respect for other human beings. So perhaps let me share with you that I think this may be the basic cause for the problems we're facing today. So once we understand this root cause, it's fairly easy to rectify it. And when I say easy, I mean it is because the solution doesn't cost money, doesn't need financial approval or government. From the governments, the solution becomes a question of individual personal choice and a decision that I'm going to turn things around in my life 180 degrees simply by the change of consciousness, the change of awareness, and living in the awareness of my own spiritual identity. 
Because from there, then our relationship with nature was completely changed. In our um, historically um, in India, there is the understanding that we have a relationship with the five elements, a little bit like the indigenous vision that was shared with us. So one of our practices is to serve the elements because we understand that having lost awareness, we've kind of taken them just as resources to satisfy our own uh, desires or greed or Now it's time to also understand that being at the heart of the capacity to change, we can really have a different input. And we've seen, as one of our colleagues earlier on spoke of Emoto's work, the impact of conscience on water, how he showed that. But you can imagine, therefore, since all our body is made of water, over 90%. And since our planet is made of water, the impact that could have the change of awareness towards matter. So one of the things that is very important for us in Raja Yoga, when we study the texts of our school, we often use water as a symbol. For example, the terms Ocean of knowledge is often used because the analogy allows to show the infinite aspects of knowledge, power, and love that God, the source of spirit and spiritual power, holds. And it also shows the organic way he has to deliver it. So, um, another essential aspect of uh, our knowledge towards water is that water plays an important role with its water cycle. So it demonstrates how there is a constant cycle of life um, in the way matter works, but also in the way spirit works. Water evaporates from the oceans through the heat of the sun and this vapor forms clouds in its turn. And then it goes into the mountains and becomes ice and rain. And then it goes in the streams. And then it allows all of us humans and non-humans to feed from it. So one of the very important things that we see is that through a spiritual practice with the five elements, we aim to recreate a balance of harmony. And one of the things that I really love um, that is from the Indian text also is that nature protects when she is protected. So this is also a strong reminder about the karma philosophy of how we are interacting with which intentions, with which spirit. So in practice, in practical terms, uh, the Brahma Kumaris do a lot of tree planting. We care for forests. We are also in our um, headquarters doing amazing water management work and purification. We are also doing a lot of awareness raising around saving water, also around the importance of sharing resources and promoting a vegetarian diet, because as you might be aware, a lot of the water of our earth is used by the food industry to grow meat, which is something that produces a lot of carbon dioxide and also consumes a lot of water. We also work um, with farmers and they have established amazing ways to work with plants that are really uh, promoting food security. Um, And because I'm working with human rights and climate change, I would like to share with you that since last month, during the Human Rights Council, uh, 
um, the human right to a healthy environment was recognized. So I think this is the result of a lot of advocacy work. And um, it is something really important for all of us. I would like also to let you know that we will have what we call a Talanoa dialogue. So it is a conversation that will happen in Glasgow on the 31st of October for the first day of the COP26. And you're all invited to participate, whether online or physically. So in conclusions, I would like to say, because I'm aware many of us still need to speak, so I don't want to take too long, um, that we promote first the importance of a change in awareness, a change in our vision, a change in lifestyle, and a change in our human relationships, understanding that we are all one family. And we promote the capacity in human beings to have respect towards the inherent dignity of each humans and all forms of life. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Valerian Bernard, for your words, lovely words, highlighting some other aspects from Brahma Kumari's tradition. That is very, very interesting. And starting with uh, the sanctity of life and the respect for other forms of life as something that uh, the traditions can give as an input to think climate adaptation. So it's not climate ad adaptation only for human species or for humankind, but for all the beings, né? for the animals and the plants and so on. And also connecting to some habits like what we eat and highlighting the importance of much more and more people becoming vegetarian. Yeah, considering that lots of uh, lots of water is, is produced for food uh, is, is used for agriculture purpose to feed animals. Yeah, so when we go to this point, we really help water in the world becoming vegetarian, and also highlight highlighting uh, this philosophy or this thing uh, that nature protects when it's protected. And it's interesting because science somehow is showing that this in many ways that when a basin is conserved, they produce environmental services and it, it serves the, the human being and all the beings. So this is very nice to, to look uh, at this angle. And also uh, the point uh, that we start with philosophy and with reflection, but we go to practice. So we are two weeks to Glasgow COP26, and this is exactly what we need to do as society, eh? go from good intentions to practice. And you explained to us how Brahma Kumaris is uh, developing and making so important works to protect water. So thank you once again, uh, I would like to give the floor to the next lecturer. So uh, our next speaker is going to be the Dharma Master Sim Tao. Uh, Dharma Master Sim Tao is, uh, is the abbot and founder of Lin Jong Mountain Buddhist Society. He's also the founder of Lin Zhou Mountain Buddhist Society, the Museum of World Religions, the Global Family for Love and Peace, and also the founder of an ongoing establish, establishment of University of Life and Peace. Through his profound practice experience, Dharma Master Sing Dao has truly seen the ori origin of life in all things. In order to solve the ecological crisis on earth, he advocates spiritual ecology and founded the University of Life and Peace. He developed an education system that integrates science, technology, politics, economy, and spiritual ecology with other international educators in various fields. So, Dharma Master Sing Tao, you have the floor, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much.
，可以吗？呃，我呢是从佛教的角度来谈适应气候变迁的一个愿景。大家好，感谢赫克先生的邀请，感谢主办单位长期以来对生态的护持。很开心有这个机会在这里跟大家一起分享生态观念。佛法是回到灵性的本来，了悟万物是同根同源，生命共同体，所以呢，可以超越世间的物质现象，再由本具的我们灵性发出大爱。慈悲大爱，生态就是灵性。啊，从佛教经典《华严经》所说的“一，即一切，一切即是一，一多相继，相互辉映，重重无尽的因陀罗这个网络，生命网络，所以灵性与生态是不可以分分割的。”问题来源在我们造作了什么？有人说，创造创造者创造了这个世界。原初呢，世界是美丽的，人心是纯善的。曾几何呢？地球已经不再健康，人类也不再不再需要养分，呃，就人类得不到养分。啊，但造物者是谁呢？他是我们每个人起心动念，人心离开了清净纯善，走向贪对立关系，痴迷于物质世界、五毒的这个呃欲念，造成了种种的恶行，破坏了地球结构体，地球的结构体。啊，颠覆了生态的平衡，酿造了气候变迁，最后形成种种地、水、火、风的灾难。人类在短短的几百年就摧毁了地球无始以来的和谐、复杂又循环性的生态系统。我们必须发现真正的问题源头，找到造作者。只有造作者觉醒，人类共同生存的危机才能化解。也就是要了解到，整个地球是一个有机体，是一个有机体，各个元素多元环扣，相依共存，彼此呢连接完，连接成完整的系统。因此，认识到万有是生命的共同体，这样的生命实况，便能积极的呼吁生态的永续。这就是佛教无缘的大慈同体的大悲的一个精神。所有的觉醒，从教育做起。我们现在。策划生命和平大学是一个推动灵性生态全球性的一个教育平台。灵性超越物质世界，灵性生态就是发现到万万物皆有灵性，从灵性的角度看到万物平等，彼此是伙伴关系。企图，所以我们不能用人本、人为本的观念作为生存的基础，企图掌控世界、掠夺地球的资源及其他生命的权利，而是以万物为本，了解每一个物种对生态的循环都有它的功能。他，我们要尊重万物存在的价值
包容彼此生存的空间，以博爱给予所需，互济共生，建立和谐永续而有复原力的循环。从灵性切入生态的有机，人类、地球、万有物种是。相继共融的生命体，多元共生，相依共存。所以，我们付出慈悲大爱，大自然肯定同步美好。当我们恶念一代，大自然必回馈返璞。这是佛教所所讲的因果定律。如果我们生命的泉源，水，它是滋养万物、滋润大地、演定气候的关键元素，并有连接多元生命、文化使命。也，各宗教都将水奉为神圣的存在，它可以净除我们身心灵的垢染，是。一切生命的泉源，人们尊重它，才才能获得圣洁的滋养与护佑。佛陀告诉我们要节约用水，养护树木，禁止污染水源，都是要净水、护水、养水的生命宝玉。近来世界各地供洪水。旱灾以不可预期的速度与范围产生重大的灾害灾难，这是生态循环恶化的终极警告，也是未来人类生存的危机。从灵性生态看待水的治理，将是一一门重要的课题与契机。灵性生态的表达是灵性。就是生态，生态就是灵性。我们将透过大学教育的平台，把灵性生态融合到各专业领域，达成跨界合作，以及产生建立于知识与灵性觉醒的行动。宗教共通的灵性，就像水一样。灌溉多元连接，共济相依的生态，引导我们一起爱地球。人类从灵性生态的角度出发，将会自觉、自律地转换目前生活方式，放下私欲的武器，停止所有的掠夺与战争。透过集体爱地球的一个动动力。让地球可以呼吸，可以得到滋养，让我们在此邀约大家，我们一同建立一所为地球、为一切生命而筹建的一个大学，在为地球、为一切生命而筹建的大学。那祝福大会顺利圆满，啊，我们让我们一起走走在爱地球的觉醒道路上，让地球平安、生态永续，也感恩爱地球的同伴们举办这一场活动，感恩我们这个生态的帕拉姆。Thank you. Thank you so much, Dharma Master Sintao, bringing us this perspective of the Buddhist tradition, and once again the oneness and that everything is connected and water makes this this connection in nature. Yeah, and this philosophy that shows the same the same way is really something very inspiring.、Uh, I highlighted some points here on your talk regarding 
we, uh, that we are all connected and unconditional compassion that in practical terms may be coming from a more material perspective. The water needs to be to all the beings, not only for the ones that have the money, no, it's for all the beings and also not for only for humans, but for, for animals and uh, plants as well. And highlighting this connection, there is, there is no difference between ecology and spirituality and spirituality is ecology is all the same thing. This is all connected. And how can we uh, give the next step and include this content and this uh, internal perspective or approach uh, to the children, to the education and this invitation for this beautiful work uh, on, on this university for peace uh, and ecology. So thank you so much, Dharma Master Sin Tao. Uh, and here in the flow of our webinar, I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, that is Ibere Guarani India, is a leadership from the Guarani people in Brazil. Uh, Ibere is an indigenous of the India, India Guarani people. He is a doctoral student by the graduate program in social anthropology at the University of Brasilia. He was a professor of social theory at the University of Acre and a professor of interpersonal relations, ethics, and citizenship under the National Access Program to Technical Education. Uh, he's also a professor of sociology, philosophy, professional ethics, and education of traditional populations at the Laboratory on Inter interethnic relations linked to the Department of Anthropology of University of Brasilia. And Iberê is also a reviewer for the Public Law Magazine and a commissioner at Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges. So Iberê, welcome so much and uh, you have 10 minutes for your talk. Aí, Chapa, bom dia. Peço licença a todos os nossos ancestrais, aos povos originários que desde antes de existir o tempo, caminharam por esses espaços todos. Sou Guarani, para nós, Guarani, a palavra, ela é muito importante, e por isso guardamos, na extensão da palavra, o silêncio, para que nós possamos ouvir tudo ao nosso redor, tudo que vibra e tudo que pulsa. Peço licença a Jassuka Sipete Tenondegua. Jassuka é nossa mãe primeira, última primeira. Jassuka é tudo que vibra, é tudo que pulsa. É a nossa mãe primeira, é a grande fonte pura e cristalina, de onde brota tudo e todos os seres, visíveis e não visíveis, humanos e não humanos. Meu nome é Iberê. Em Guarani, caminho da água. Assim, nós caminhamos, aprendemos a a cultivar o silêncio, aprendemos o nosso caminhar, aprendemos a contornar o que chamam de obstáculos. Nós somos água, depois nos esquecemos disso. Para nós que estamos caminhando nesses tempos todos, o nosso 
sentido de caminhar, é, atravessar esse, esse mundo, o um mundo de desigualdades, o um mundo de injustiças e mostrar um coração puro e transparente quando atravessarmos essa terra das coisas que morrem. Nós, em nosso idioma, falamos Uvu Mbae Megua, Uvu Mbae Megua, terra das coisas que morrem. Nosso sentir é estar maduro como um fruto maduro. O fruto, quando está maduro, nós falamos que ele está em estado de aguijé. Quando um padjé, um ancião, está maduro e pleno, e que nós não enxergamos mais o seu corpo, em que ele transparece a palavra última primeira, nós dizemos que ele está em estado de aguijé. Quando agradecemos a alguém, desejamos de todo o coração que ele esteja em estado de aguide. Esse é o nosso caminhar. Mas nós caminhamos em um mundo de desigualdades. Muitas vezes podemos chorar. Queimam os nossos territórios, nos expulsam, queimam as nossas florestas, o lixo sufoca, a pata do boi magoa o solo. Nós olhamos para nossa grande mãe sem termos como socorrer a vida e mesmo assim buscamos estar com os nossos corações sem desejar e sem ter como inimigos. Cantamos todos os dias para acalmar o coração do colonizador, para que a sua sede continental não seja tão grande que ele comece a comer a si mesmo. E fazemos isso. Nós vivemos em um mundo, o um nosso mundo, e aprendemos que todas e todos e todas somos parentes como tudo que vibra e tudo que pulsa, como a nossa grande mãe, Jassuka Sukete, de onde viemos, os nossos ni as palavras alma que habitam o corpo que nós vemos. Eles vêm de uma mesma fonte originária, e por isso costumamos dizer que somos todos parentes. Somos parentes de tudo que vive e tudo que pulsa. Somos parentes de tudo que flui e tudo que se desdobra. Somos parentes. O gavião é parente da serpente que se enrodilha como se de si se desembainhasse. O sopro do vento na rua, pelos ares formando são as palavras formosas dos nossos avós. Somos parentes dos que na água vivem, juntos de Jassuka, Su, Ete, a mãe primeira, a tataravó da avó que vemos. Somos parentes dos mortos e das montanhas, parentes de Nyamandu, cujo coração, o sol, o tataravô desse sol, que vemos para estar aqui para conversar com vocês eu tive que andar muitos quilômetros ter a internet lá fora chove nossa grande mãe molha a nossa face quando terminar esse nosso encontro uma vez mais retornaremos subiremos o rio 12 horas de viagem por isso, a minha gratidão a todas e vocês que estão aí. Por isso, essas palavras. E que essas palavras cheguem perto dos vossos corações, conversem com os vossos silêncios. Nós vivemos hoje em um mundo 
em que existem 45 mil barragens construídas que já expulsaram mais de 80 milhões de pessoas de suas terras. No Brasil, são mais de 2 mil barragens e querem construir mais 4 mil, seja para o abastecimento de água, seja para a produção de energia. E 650 dessas são hidrelétricas e suas barragens já expulsaram mais de um milhão de pessoas. Nós vivemos nesse tempo, um tempo em que o olhar para dentro dos rios que correm em nós nos faz olhar para aquilo que aparentemente está fora, os rios que correm fora de nós. Não há dentro e não há fora. Os rios estão lambendo, beijando a terra. Os rios estão abaixo da terra e os rios estão voando. Os nossos rios são voadores. Quando as estradas impedem, quando as barragens impedem, eles sobem e vão banhar outras partes do continente. Assim nós fazemos. Nós sabemos que para os rios continuarem o seu percurso, é necessário respeitar e guardar a diversidade. A pobreza do mundo é uma pobreza de diversidade. Um idioma apagando milhares de idiomas. Uma religião apagando milhares de formas de lidar com o sagrado. Uma cultura, uma educação. Mas nós, povos originários, somos de antes do tempo existir. Nós continuamos e continuaremos cultivando e semeando a vida, fazendo com que os rios corram dentro e fora de nós. Um rio estancado é uma vida que deixa de seguir o seu fluxo. Se nós estancarmos uma parte do rio que corre em nosso corpo, essa parte definha morre. Um rio estancado é um rio triste, é um rio só. Não podemos deixá-lo só. Nós vivemos em um mundo, em um país, em que existem 83 mil quilômetros de rios. 83 mil quilômetros de rios e todos eles poluídos. Existem 31 milhões de brasileiros que não têm água encanada. E existem 11,5 milhões que moram em casas com mais de três pessoas por quarto. Existem 5,8 milhões que não têm banheiro. E os rios todos estão contaminados. 7,6 milhões de pessoas não possuem moradia em um mesmo país em que tem 7,9 milhões de moradias que não possuem pessoas. Não há água potável em nenhuma comunidade indígena. E em São Paulo, em grandes cidades como São Paulo, chove toda a tabela periódica e mais coliformes fecais. Essa dita civilização, esse pretenso desenvolvimento que nos quer todas e todos, sinônimos de todos e de ninguém, esquece que os rios nos ensinam a gramática da sublevação. Os nossos rios são insubordinados, constroem barragens, eles partem e nos mostram que não podemos nos acanhar, não podemos nos constranger. Devemos, sim, semear a vida, continuar os caminhos antigos, respeitar os nossos ancestrais e fazer com que tudo que vibra e tudo que pulsa possa vibrar e pulsar por si mesmo. Esse é um mundo em que caibam muitos mundos, os nossos mundos, todos em comunhão, na possibilidade 
de bem viver, de conviver. O bem viver é uma palavra que foi forjada, foi construída agora há pouco, mas ele bebe nos saberes dos povos originários e, portanto, ele não será um, não será único, será milhões, será milhares e expressará as formas de ser, pensar e sentir de cada uma e cada um de nós. Nós, povos originários, respeitamos tudo que nos circula, porque tudo que nos circula somos nós. São os nossos antigos que vêm nos visitar. Quando sentimos muitas saudades dos que partiram e, não, e sentimos vontade de estar com eles, e um vento molha e bate em nosso rosto, são os nossos antigos nos acariciando. E assim continuamos. Talvez o civilizado, talvez aquele que surgiu, nasceu e cresceu dentro das cidades, não saiba, não tenha nunca chegado a conhecer a beleza da simplicidade e da imperfeição. Nós, sendo simples e imperfeitos, aprendemos com tudo que nos cerca. Uma sociedade da velocidade, uma sociedade incapaz de experiência, uma sociedade em que nada lhe passa pelo coração. E o meu tempo está acabando, tem muita coisa para compartilhar com vocês e aprendi muito. Gratidão, Água e GVT, que sigamos nós, aprendendo com os rios, aprendendo a beleza da simplicidade e que nossos corações estejam um dia puros e cristalinos como uma grande fonte de onde viemos e que se se tudo der certo, retornaremos e faremos uma grande festa. A EVT, a EVT. Thank you so much, Bere, for your uh, touching words, but also highlighting the great challenges we have in some places of the of the world. Yeah, we have challenges in all the places, but there are some places that the challenges are bigger related to water and climate adaptation. And usually it connects to people and population that has less access to uh, resources, money and so on. So it's important to bring to this spiritual perspective approach also this material and reality uh, of the necessity of focusing on those communities that are suffering more and has, has less access to water and instruments to adapt to climate change. Uh, I would like to highlight also from your words that uh, we're going to a new climate scenario with lots of challenges and changes. And we need to learn, you, you mentioned that we need to be as water, yeah? that go around the obstacles. And this is really something that we need to find how to make it because the obstacles are in all the places and water can also teach us on this, on this way on how to manage difficulties and challenges and so on. So thank you so much for your talk. We go now, we, ha we are a little bit delayed in our schedule, but we are Uh, in our last uh, lecture. So uh, I would like to invite Sister Marvin Solas. Sister Marvin Solas was missioned in Taiwan from 1998 to 2012, where she accompanied people experience homelessness, particularly women. She worked and collaborated with other homeless providers, the Taichung government and women organizations as well as academic institutions on various issues related to homelessness. Sister Marvi is now missioned at the Mary, Mary No Sister Center, Mary no, New York, serving as NGO representative of the Mary no Sisters to the United Nations, part of the Mary no Office for Global Concerns team until December 2021. So, Sister Marvi Misolas, thank you to be here, and you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you so much. You are muted. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. Uh, and I'm really, really grateful uh, for this invitation to speak on the panel to all who are participating. Um, I really feel listening to you uh, that uh, the energy that connects uh, to all of us right now. So um, <clears throat> in listening to everybody, um, I, I really think that spirituality has three important aspects, relationship, values, and life purposes. Adaptation has to do with change or the process of change which an organism or species adjust to uh, our environment. Our dialogue is in the context of water and climate change. We must have new perspective. Spirituality is informed, a spirituality that is informed by science. To understand these three aspects together, I recall a Native American uh, proverb that is, the frog does not drink up the pond in which it leaves. Water and climate, two of the Earth's spheres, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere are in constant interaction with the other two, the lithosphere and the biosphere, a form of symbiotic relationship that has a purpose to maintain life. Water and climate have their own integrity as part of the Earth system that maintain life. I think to further my uh, um, reflection uh, this morning, I would like to share my story uh, to reflect the topic that we are talking. I, I was born in the Philippines. In 1968, my family migrated internally from the southern part of the island of Luzon, Philippines, to the newly sprawling river town of Marikina. The local people speak Tagalog dialect from the word Tagailog which means inhabitants of the river or by the river. The Marikina River winds along Eastern Manila, Philippines. It is the largest tributary of Pasig River with headwaters located in the Sierra Madre Mountains of Rizal Province. Important stories, myths and poetry have been written by its people about the river as their cultural legacy. Marikina River, was Marikina River was an important commerce and transport used or throughout by the Chinese and Arab traders before and during the Spanish colonial era. The Spanish Jesuits landed in shores and established their mission territory in one of the villages. The fluvial towns of Marikina River were the food plains because of its rich soils. Other forms of inland transport eventually took over river transport. This resulted in the lack of river transport traffic and the deforestation of the upland areas to give way to the people's housing affected what is now the upper Marikina River Basin protected landscape, contributed to the siltation of the river. In 1960s, factories mushroomed along the river banks. The lack of environmental laws and ordinances to oversee this polluted Marikina River. In 1991, a concerted effort to clean the polluted river is slowly succeed up to this point. I will ask Abraham to move the slides, please. I just would like to uh, show you um, <clears throat> where, where, where are we uh, moving from. Um, this is the situation. Um, I think there's another. Um, there's another slides before this, Abra. Okay. Um, uh, so, sister, this is the first one. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, um, and what what I'm uh, going to go now is that on September 2000, uh, 2009, Typhoon Kedsana, or locally named Ondoy, dumped about 258.6 millimeter of rain in Metro Manila. Within a matter of hours, Kedsana submerged most part of Manila, causing a 1.5 billion in damages and 921 fatalities. The river, which was once steaming with life and supported life to these communities, now becomes a deadly tributary, um, <clears throat> causing uh, loss of lives and suffering of displacements of millions of inhabitants in Marikina and nearby towns. Typhoons in the category of Kedsana are increasing in the frequency 
So we can move some of the slides. Uh, these are the aftermath of Typhoon Kitsana uh, in 2009. And as you can see, this is uh, taken from the Marikina and uh, nearby towns. Next slide, please. Um, and this is also part of the Kitsana. And so um, next slide uh, would give us uh, an idea of, of how, you know, typhoon of this category um, in the Philippines have been be becoming very common. Now, this is just last year in 2020, where two typhoons, one after the another, have been, have been uh, really fumbling uh, um, uh, the Philippines. So um, what, what I would like to point here is that um, people are really uh, you know, tired of disasters, especially uh, extreme disasters, uh, water-related disasters. And uh, I think Filipinos cannot keep up with, with disasters. Um, we have what we call disaster fatigue. Filipinos are just busy surviving from one calamity to another. And of course, I'm not just saying, you know, Filipinos, I'm also speaking for communities who have been, you know, suffering from all, all these calamities uh, brought by water-related disasters. So I can say that climate, climate adaptation, as we are talking here, has its limit. So those who are responsible for green gas uh, emission and inept governments must stop playing up the term resilience and must deliver to the promise made in the Paris Agreement. Um, next slide, please. So local people have been have been um, <clears throat> have been um, uh, and we can go to the next slides if we can. <clears throat> So um, local people have been working, especially women frontliners in the river ad uh, adaptation initiatives. But this is not this is not um, enough. I think we really need to to make a big shift uh, during this COP twenty six. So I think, and I ask, what do we mean when we say spirituality for adaptation? We cannot speak of spirituality of adaptation without water justice or climate justice. We must evoke the call to writing our relationship. And so with this, a new perspective, and I would like to, us to suggest that we refer to Thomas Berry's 10 principle of jurisprudence. We must understand our place as humans in the evolutionary deep time. The key is to have the evolutionary consciousness where humanity's place is and where we are going. So I'm, you know, for, for time purposes, um, I would like to focus on the uh, principles um, number five, which is the next slide, and number nine. So um, <clears throat> in the principle number five of these 10, ten principles, um, Abraham, if you could move the slides, please, I would like to share. Um, Every component of the earth community, and we know that we are part of the earth community as water, um, has, the, has the three important rights, the right to be, the right to habitat, and the right to fulfill its role in the ever renewing processes of the earth community. I think we've heard this over and over with a, a, a previous speakers. And this is what um, Thomas, Father Thomas Berry have uh, you know, is trying for us to understand that earth community, we are, we are a community of uh, uh, subjects here on earth. And so the, the um, <clears throat> principle number nine um, also reflects what we have just uh, been uh, talking. So if you could move the slides, Abraham, I'll be thankful. Um, <clears throat> so um, principle number nine is that these rights are represented here uh, are based on the intrinsic relation that various components of Earth have to each other. The planet Earth is a single community bound together with interdependent relationships. No human being nourishes itself. Each component of the Earth community is immediately or immediately dependent on every member of the community for the nourishment and assistance it needs for its own survival. This mutual nourishment, which includes the predator-prey relationship, is integral 
with the role that each component of the earth of the earth has within the comprehensive community of existence. So I think to, to, to make this uh, in a simple way is that we are all one, we are all interdependent. Um, if, we, if we do not uh, do uh, something, we, we do not change our perspective, you know, with, with the uh, 11 years that, has, that we are talking in terms of science, how, how the uh, hothouse trajectory of the planet will happen um i don't know i think i think we must choose we must choose the direction that we need to take and with that i'm thankful uh listening i've learned a lot so thank you very much so sister marvin isolas thank you so much for your closing speech that was excellent and highlighted some important issues like the water and gender. Water is recognized as a feminine element in almost all traditions. And, but on the other hand, who makes the management of water in our society are men. So something is wrong on that. So the importance of uh, gar to guarantee the participation of the woman in the management of water that is very important. And also to include the social layer of reality, yeah? and the injustice and try and work to uh, work for climate justice as something very important to be addressed in this uh, climate adaptation uh, initiatives. Uh, you also highlighted the point that uh, one of the rights that you, that you mentioned is the right to be, yeah? And it's important maybe to register here that many countries are working uh, in the recognition of rivers as beings yeah, of entities and their rights. So it's happening in India, in New Zealand, Australia, in Europe, in Brazil, they're trying to do the same. So uh, the right to be, yeah, they yeah. have the right to be clean and pristine and uh, conserved. So thank you so much once again, Mr. Marvi. And now uh, we finish the, the, the lectures and we are going to start <clears throat> a brief question and answer. Yeah, because we are already uh, with a delay, uh, a little bit late. So I will do some, I will read some questions here uh, in that were, was done, uh, was done in the chat. So let me find it here. Okay, so I'll do uh, a block of questions. I'll read all the questions and then I'll open for brief interactions of the, of the lectures. Now we don't need to have all the lectures interacting uh, because we have a few time, but uh, those that want, want to comment or uh, explain uh, the questions, please do so. Uh, so the first question that is from Hank Holslag. Uh, I, I, as I understood, it was to Maria. It is an idea that the faith and community leaders get training in actions that can mitigate problem, problems of climate change. She's asking if this is an idea to, uh, uh, to train faith and community leaders uh, uh, for actions to mitigate problems of climate change. So this is the first question. Uh, Dinu Bumbari asked, are there specific examples of heritage conservation practices in the metropolitan areas that reconnect water, spirituality, faith, and heritage conservation? So this is Dinu's question. Uh, and then Patrick Musini from Nairobi, Kenya, he asks, there is commendable high level intervention to mitigate on the adverse elements of climate change. What are the local interventions that reach the local ordinary citizen who may not be privy to these high level interventions? So this comment on how can we go to, to the local and right? not only discussion in high level meetings. And, and the last question to the lecturers, is from Vijay Suparan. Uh, 
Is there a need for face-based inspiration solutions to connect with policy at some point, or should they work on a parallel track? Very interesting point. So this discussion should go inside COP, for example, or it should go, go in parallel. So let's see uh, the, the thoughts and the, the comments of, of our lecturers. So uh, you can comment those questions, please. The floor is yours. Um, I just had a thought that in many of the organizations that are face-based, are working in many directions that you have just commented in your questions. So you have people who are doing advocacy work within the Human Rights Council at the UNFCCC during the COPs with the negotiators, but also many faith-based organizations are working with local people to help find solutions to the crisis that we are facing. But as well as that, I think spirituality provides means of becoming resilient to everyone. That is so important because working with the cops, at the cops, one of the things that happens is that there is so much anxiety and depression around what's happening today. So faith brings also a way to look at the situation that brings a lot of uh, strengths and power and hope. And the last thing I wanted to comment on the situation is that also you have many gatherings now of different faiths who are uniting to bring solutions at the level, for instance, of investments in the bank. So people are withdrawing their money from different faiths it's because they don't want to invest in dirty uh, energy or people are looking into ways to change their lives or to promote in their community solar systems. So like this, you have many examples. Thank you for your questions and the time. Thank you, Valeria. And I, I see that Maria want to make a comment as well, Maria. Thank you very much. Um, I I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, reply on the first and the last question. I'm really sorry. I have to leave after this. I would love to stay and discuss with you, um, but but I I hadn't expected to be staying this long. Anyway, so the first question about do uh, the faith communities need to be educated? I think that was more or less the question. If you know, and I think that. Um, as we have seen here today, the all the faith communities very much understand the value of water. Uh, so, um, I, and I are very well educated in the the sacredness of water. And whenever anyone feels a um, a, a religious relationship with water, which all religions do. This is uh, super important. So I think the faith communities, the, I think the churches and the mosques, as is mentioned in the question, uh, are quite aware of this. People always have to, you know, every one of us have to to understand our relationship with water. But I think what what as um, as Hassan said, we should also very much look at. Uh, uh, large corporations and, you know, the little man can't fix everything. Um, so that was one quick comment to that. And then there was a question about legislation, whether the faith community should be included in legislation. I think faith communities and in, I count indigenous people uh, as faith communities as well. Uh, they are part of society and community. So, of course, their views should somehow be reflected in legislation. Uh, you can't say that legislation is not for religious people. Um, I think uh, in uh, modern uh, democracies, it's really, and in all discussions about climate change, it is absolutely vital that everyone is heard. And very often, politicians hear out um, 
big corporations, they hear out other politicians, they hear out science. Science has uh, quite, uh, and civil society, but very often they forget to ask the faith communities. And I think that is a big loss uh, because faith, as I said, faith communities have a lot to offer. Anyway, I, I'm I'm really sorry, but I have to leave now. But thank you so much. It was so, and thank you uh, to all the colleagues. It was really good to hear you. Thank you. And thank you for organizing, Saj and Abraham. Sorry. Thank you, Maria. So let's see if you have uh, any other comments from our speakers. Someone else want to interact with the with the questions? Miss mm -hmm. uh, Sister Marvi, please. Um, yes, um, I would like to, I think, uh, mention about um, uh, education uh, of, of uh, religious uh, leaders. Um, yeah, because I think I, I think for me, I will speak for myself is because from from my mission in Taiwan, when I left, I, I uh, went in 2012 uh, to join the University for Peace in Costa Rica to mainly uh, study uh, peace, um, sustainability and the environment. And uh, that was really led led me to um, to work on climate change because that was what the subject that I had uh, studied. Um, even though um, I'm very much interested with with the spirituality, um, so I think uh, in terms of um, our our uh, communities of uh, uh, spiritual um, people. We, we really have to engage with this. Marinol Sisters is engaged with um, uh, Climate Solutions um, uh, Fund, which is um, uh, the fund is uh, put to, to invest in environmental and sustainability governance. So I just would like to uh, uh, include that. Okay, Sister Marvi, thank you so much for your comment. Complementation. So, uh, can I, oh, uh, Dharma Master Sin Tao, want to make a final comment? If it's possible to be the last one, any one of the speakers want to talk more? Because if we can close with Dharma Master, it would be great in order to stay on time. So, Dharma Master Sin Tao, please. I can't hear his his voice. The translator is translating. I can't hear the English version of Dharma Master right now. Uh, Mr. Lee, is there something I can help you with? Okay. We're having a technical problem here. Uh, is it possible to solve, Abraham? Do you know to listen uh, Dharma Master Sin Tao? <laughs> we are having a technical problem here. I will advance considering we are delayed here, we are on time. Let's make a, a final uh, I try once again with Dharma Master Sin Tao to see if the audio works. So if you can say again, Master Dharma Master Sin Tao, please. Let's try once again. We cannot hear. Not here, Chang. OK,感謝我們的主辦單位,還有我們所有的參與者,大家的心意良意言是非常好,我覺得都是能夠我們貼切的共同的 
，呃，能够把这个生态的一个灵性，这个我们贴切的了解了，我们应该把灵性灌溉在，呃，这个生态的一切的空间。那我想，我们这个最重要还是从尊重、包容，尊重每一个生态、每一个存在它的价值，包容它的空间。也共同呢，可以彼此把给予的分享，共同来分享的博爱，所以我们一切的合作都从尊重、包容、博爱，共同爱地球、爱和平。感谢灵性给我们的所有的连接。Thank you <笑>。Thank you so much, Dharma Master Sintao, for your words, closing words. So, with uh, this participation, we are going to the final part of of our webinar. Uh, the one of the speakers uh, mentioned the term crystal clear. Crystal clear, yeah. And what is crystal clear for me right now is the the, the importance and the necessity. Of having this uh, uh, spiritual approach when it goes to climate adaptation uh, is really a, a big contribution that can come from this uh, traditional knowledge in many many ways in terms of practices, in terms of internal internal attitudes, in terms of ethics. So uh, I think we really should advance on this agenda of the culture, the heritage, and the, the collaboration that the spiritual traditions in, can give to climate adaptation. I want I want to remember once again that today we are launching this community of practice on water and culture in the website of the Global Adaptation Global Center on Adaptation. So I ask the organizers to post. Once again, the link in the chat in order that people that want to participate in this initiative of gathering people that want to discuss and that that want to go deep in this uh, spiritual contribution for adaptation. Yeah, so the link is going is is in the chat already. So I'd like to thank all the participants, all the lecturers, and all the participants for this wonderful event. And uh, desire a great day, afternoon, or night for all of you. Okay, so thank you very much. And here we close our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>